would you look at your worship guide and read along with me a Monday Thursday litany. I'll read the light print if you would respond please by reading together the bold print. Jesus said, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. On this day, Christ gathered with his disciples in the upper room. On this day, Christ took a towel and washed the disciples' feet. On this day, Christ broke bread for his disciples, telling them to eat. On this day, Christ poured out wine, telling them to drink of the cup of new life. On this day, Christ gave his whole self that we too might follow and find abundant life. Merciful God, we offer you our lives, full as they are of shadow and light, of kindness and apathy, of hope and despair. Take what is broken and mend it. Take what is wrong and right it. Take what is destructive and disable it. Take what is useless and make it useful. Heal our sin, we pray. By this shall the world know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. Amen. Would you stand as we sing our opening hymn, number 188. together in prayer. O oh Lord, for all the memories, the traditions, the scriptures, the prayers that this night brings to us, we give you thanks. For the scriptural memory of Jesus who girded himself about with a towel and washed his disciples' feet. For Jesus, who was troubled greatly because of the cup that he would soon have to drink. For Jesus, who was stirred almost to despair because of the betrayal that would happen this night. O oh Lord, for the reminder that we too must watch and pray lest we be overcome. For all these memories of scripture for worship services in years bygone for promises that we have made to you because of the reminders of this night oh lord for all these memories hopes inspirations and exhortations we give you thanks we confess our sins 
And we long to be made pure. We long to be stirred in our hearts. We long to serve you more faithfully. Oh, Lord, help us to serve you as you served the disciples. Help us to serve you as you served the world through your death. Help us, O oh Lord, to love one another as you have loved us. We pray these things, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. John 13. After he had washed their feet, 
had put on his robe and had returned to the table. He said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for that's what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I've chosen. But it is to fulfill the scripture. The one who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I tell you this now before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Very truly, I tell you, whoever receives one whom I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. After saying this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and declared, Very truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter, therefore, motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So while reclining next to Jesus, the beloved disciple asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it into the dish. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. After he had received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the common purse, Jesus was telling him, Buy what we have needed for the feast, or that he should give something for the poor. So after receiving the piece of bread, Judas immediately went out, and it was night. Maundy Thursday gets its name from the Latin word mandare, very similar to our word mandate. Mandatus is the fourth principal part. It means something that has to be done. It's a commandment. Maundy Thursday refers to this commandment to love one another, this commandment to, to do as I have done to you, to wash one another's feet. The Gospel of John has multiple references to the love of God, more so than any other of the Gospels. And of course, the most famous and often quoted and probably most often misinterpreted verse in all of the New Testament is John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And what's so misinterpreted about that? It's the little word so. When we use the word so, it has multiple meanings. One of them is the meaning of extent. Thank you so much, we say. It's, we're thanking you a lot. It's the meaning of extent. But the word for so in this particular passage of John 3.16 is a Greek word that in this instance uh, means, it can mean then sometimes, but in this instance, for God so loved the world, it means in this way. In this way, thus God loved the world that he gave his son. The death of Jesus, the thing that he reenacted in an acted parable symbolically when he washed the disciples' feet and told them that they must wash one another's feet, was an action whereby he showed what it meant to be a servant and to allude, say, to Mark 10, 45, for the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for the many. The death of Jesus on Calvary's tree is this, is this act of the servant of, of Yahweh, the servant of God, Isaiah 52, 12 to 53, 13. Uh, it's, the, it's the servant passage. It, it tells what the servant of the Lord does on behalf of his people. He gives himself a ransom for the many. And so you and I come to this evening and we see this marvelous text. It's a text that points to Jesus serving the world on our behalf. And I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. He said this indicating 
what manner of death he was to die. He gave himself as an act of service on our behalf. And he told the disciples, do you know, do you understand what I have done? What I have done is an example for you to follow as well. As the Lord did, so we as his followers are to do. To be willing to take up the cross, as the synoptics say, and follow him. To give our lives on behalf of others. The supreme act of love is the, li is the, is the, is the life of sacrifice. It's the life of patience. The word love in those key New Testament passages is not a word that points to romantic feeling or emotional enthusiasm as much as it points to the disciplines of service and giving and sacrifice and doing on behalf of others. Our passage points to Jesus, the servant who served, who girded himself with a towel. Jesus, the one who told his disciples that, that we should serve also as he has served. Jesus, who was deeply troubled when the drama then began to unfold. The parable that he had acted out was now beginning. He came to serve, and then he warned the disciples, one of you will betray me. They feared. They said, what does he mean by this? Who can he possibly mean? The beloved disciple makes his motions with his hand and tells uh, Peter, who's close to Jesus, uh, they're not sitting a la Leonardo da Vinci around a table. They're reclining on the floor on their sides and on their elbow. And there's a small board, a uh, small, barely elevated uh, four, five, or six inch table uh, on the floor. He leans back and he says, who's he talking about? Jesus whispers back to, to Peter, it is the one for whom I shall dip this piece of bread, the morsel. He dips it. He hands it to Judas. It's very interesting in the text because it tells us at that moment, though, though we know that Judas has been planning the betrayal, Judas already has the money in exchange. Judas has told them where they're going to meet. Judas has already told them how he's going to do it. It'll be dark, but you'll know who the one is to grab because I'll go up and kiss him on the cheek. All of that is planned. But John seems to indicate that there's still one final, perhaps, ray of hope and light for Judas. Maybe. Because when Jesus dips the morsel, he no doubt looked at him and said, what you do, do quickly. Jesus knew his intentions. Jesus knew what to expect. The others didn't know what was in Judas's heart, but Jesus did. But the text then says, after he received the morsel, Satan entered him. The last moment of his will was eclipsed by the will of Satan. And he gave in to do what he had been working toward and moving toward for many, many days and hours. Judas betrayed his master. This text reminds us that we too are vulnerable. His closest friends, Peter, James, and John, went with him to the garden. And Peter, James, and John fell asleep. Three times he tried to wake them up, but still they slept. And he warned them of the impending danger. Peter reminds us in very similar words, echoing no doubt the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter echoes those in, a, in his letter, 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9. Be on the lookout. Watch and pray. Be on the lookout. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. May God enable us to live as witnesses to the serving love of Jesus in the world. The next lesson is from John 13, 31 to 35. When he'd gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God's been glorified in him. If God's been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. 
Little children, I'm with you only a little while longer. You'll look for me. And as I told to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> um, when I was <clears throat> a little bit younger, I was um, really into apologetics. Apologetics are uh, kind of a science or a discipline of um, using, you know, uh, philosophy and logic and some historical data to not prove the truthfulness of the Christian faith, but at least to defend it against um, uh, the, the, the claim of irrationality. So I, I still think apologetics serve a great purpose. Um, <clears throat> I'm no longer as confident as I was when I was, say, 13, um, that apologetics you know, can prove um, the Christian faith. Um, but I do think they serve the good purpose of showing that it is believable and that it is, that it is uh, defensible. Um, that's really what the word of apologetics means. It means defense. Right? So it shows that it's defensible. Um, I, not just in terms of my own, you know, maturation spiritually or emotionally or, or just intellectually, but also um, just from a, d- a deep, um, a deep um, growth and dive into the scriptures themselves, have become more and more convinced that one of the strongest apologetics that the church can have. Um, is precisely what Jesus names here. Um, Jesus Jesus says in in verse 35, by this everyone will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Um, This, of course, doesn't mean that apologetics is a a bad pursuit or intellectual apologetics aren't, aren't aren't good. Um, and after all, he, he isn't saying, by this you will, everyone will know that the Christian faith is true. What he says is, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples. But, but nonetheless, I, I do think that one of the strong witnesses of the church um, in showing the glory and strength and beauty of Christ himself is uh, showing the beauty of the love that he showed us. Um, he even uses this glorification language in this passage when he said that um, now the Son of Man has been glorified and God has been glorified in him and God will glorify me soon enough. And he's, he's there in that passage referring, it seems, to his, his impending death where he will show his love for his, his disciples in the most extensive way. Into this moment of glorification that Christ shows the world, the moment that uh, he shines the light of God on the world is precisely in the moment when darkness tried to overcome Christ and his love for his people and couldn't. The moment when darkness tried to overshadow Christ's love for his people and simply could not overcome it. This is the prologue of John where John says that the light shone in the world and the darkness tried to overcome it and couldn't because the light shone in the world and it's, it's referring to the ministry of Jesus in all his facets. John 13 opens with this line where he says that, uh, um, that uh, Jesus uh, loved his own disciples and having loved them, he loved them to the end. That the moment of his death, the moment of his giving of himself for his disciples was not the first moment that he began to love his disciples. It wasn't the first moment that he gave himself for his disciples. It was the culminating event. It was the climactic moment in which his whole life of self-giving was finally fulfilled and, and uh, perfected in his self-giving for his disciples. Having then, as he, as, as, um, he said earlier, um, having, having washed their feet and, and shown them what it means to serve other people and to love other people, he says, I give you a new, a new commandment that you love one another Just as I have loved you, you should love one another. People have often rightfully, understandably said, how is this a new commandment? Leviticus 19 says, love your neighbor as yourself. It's it's an old commandment, actually. 
I think the newness of it is not simply the fact that you ought to love one another. It's his demonstration as to what this love will look like. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Parentheses. You've always known that you're supposed to love one another. But now you know what it looks like to love one another. Do it in the way I've done, which is the giving of my whole life for you. And in this way, the world will know that you have been learning from me. That's what he means by you're my disciples. Disciples just means people who've been learning. The whole world will know that you are people who have learned from Jesus by the way that you love one another. In this season of moving into reflection and remembering Christ's death, certainly it should fuel our own intents and purposes and attempts and desire to love the way that he did. But in these next few days, we can also use it to focus on and be grateful for the way that he loved us. He loved us not by exploiting us. He loved us not by taking advantage of us. He loved us not by using his power to show us how strong he was. He loved us by giving his whole life for us from the moment he came to the moment he died. Father in heaven, thank you for this day. Thanks for this time. Thanks for these people. We love you, Lord. We ask that as we reflect on your love for us, that we love in the way that you've loved us. We trust you and we pray all these things in the name of your Son. Amen. The death of Jesus is an expression not only of his love for the Father, but of course his love, especially in these texts, for his followers and the exhortation that we love one another. The meal that we will share in now, the Lord's Supper, celebrated that night, the night in which he was betrayed, is a meal that reminds us of our new covenant relationship with the Father through Jesus. And it also was used for that troubled church in Corinth to remind them that they belong to one another and that they must not eat or drink selfishly or unworthily of the bread and cup of the Lord. For I delivered to you, Paul says, as of first importance, what I also received, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had broken it, he gave thanks and said, This is my body given for you. Take, eat. And in the same manner, the cup also, after supper, he gave thanks and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remission of your sins. All of you drink from it. And so now with the help of these who serve the Lord in the administering of the bread and the cup, we share together doing this in remembrance of him and doing this also in remembrance of our love for God and one another.
during the seasons of Advent and Christmas, we talk often about telling God's story, about retelling the story. This is really the very purpose of us gathering together each Sunday is that we remind each other, we remind ourselves and each other of God's story, the story of the redemption of humankind through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the same way, during the season of Lent, which concludes this weekend, we also again focus on retelling this story, reliving it as best as we can, as best as we can understand from the scripture and from uh, the, the spoken word and from hymns and songs and poetry, we relive the, the anxiety of Thursday night. We relive the, the chaos and the darkness of Friday. We relive the utter despair of Saturday so that we more fully, more truly, much more richly embrace and celebrate the joy of Sunday. And so, as we conclude this service, and because we won't meet again until Sunday morning, our hymn of commitment is one that I hope will remind you to relive this story over these next few days. It's number 642. It's one we should probably sing more often. Jesus, keep me near the cross. As we stand together to sing, would you let this be your commitment?
I'm so glad that you were here this evening. Knowing who is here today, I, I don't have to encourage you to be here Sunday morning. I know you will be. Um, if you haven't invited someone to join you yet, do so. You have a few days. In the meantime, in a moment, you'll receive your benediction. Following that, I invite you to leave this, linger as long as you like, but leave this place very aware of the reliving of these days to come. And join us Sunday morning back here in this sanctuary for a morning of pure joy in Christ. Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. He took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. Rest these days, and on the third day, look expectantly for the Lord. Amen.